I've been extremely privileged, but also a little humble, being invited as one of your guests for this occasion. And I can't help remembering that this is the 50th anniversary of the arrival of the United States Air Force <coughs> to Britain. And that from that moment on, we flew together towards the same objective. I think that your idea of dedicating this room to those who gave their lives in the cause of freedom is very meaningful. And what I'd like to do, if I may, is express my thoughts rather by way of my own personal experience. I remember well two days before I was due to report to my operational squadron on early June 1940. Suddenly thinking, in a few days' time I should be in action. What's going to happen? I just could not see myself standing up to it. When I arrived at the station, army of Griffield in Yorkshire, I think that I was so nervous that I'm not sure I didn't salute the corporal on duty, <laughs> so him saluting me. But once I got inside, somehow everything changed. We saw that everybody was going about their job just as if nothing unusual was happening. You felt you had to go with the stream, you could not be different. And then for the first time, I began to feel tradition. We heard about tradition during our training, but this was the first time I actually felt it. You realized that the road that you were going to walk, other men and women had walked before you in years gone by. And in a sense, you were now in their shoes, and you realize that somehow you had to live up to the example that they had set. And that in itself carried you. Of course, tradition is a living thing. Each generation adds to what went before. Your generation today adds to whatever little we added during World War II. So I would say that when it comes to courage or achievement in war, you have to see it in the context of achievement. I know that some men get picked out for the spotlight, but I know in my heart, and so do all others to whom that has happened, that whatever we achieved was achieved as a member of the team, not an individual. You could not have done it as an individual. Though perhaps here I have to make an exception of those whom I admire most of all, special forces, those who operated in occupied Europe totally alone never knowing from minute to minute whether there might be a knock on the door and in come the Gestapo. How they did that, and I know some of them, I don't know. Perhaps I could pause for a second and say that the other day I had, a, for the first time, an intimate talk with Odette. Odette was a girl, a French girl, dropped into Europe, betrayed in court, and tortured for two years, or kept in solitary confinement for two years, and tortured quite frequently. She never broke down, she never gave anything away. I said to her, Adet, I said, I just can't see myself standing up to torture and not breaking down. She said, don't say such a stupid thing. He said, none of us know, but you'll find that when the time comes, if it does, it'll be different. 
you will find that you get a strength we never knew you had. She said, I put myself in God's hands. I said, if you want me to be pushed beyond the limit, well, there's something I can do. But if you want me not to betray anybody, help me. Well, there was much more to it than that, but that basically was her story. And as I followed your prayer at the beginning, I thought, I wish that we in the RAF would do what you do, and start your ceremonies with a prayer, we would be better off. But although, as I say, one is a member of a team, there are certain things that you do have to try and do, which are taught. I think the first thing is that you have to know and keep clearly in your mind what your goal is, what is your ultimate goal. Keep that in mind and then be able to work out your priorities. What is taking me towards that goal and what is not? What is actually crucial to achieve and what is less crucial? To throw away your life or put your life in great danger for just a small objective would not be responsible in my humble view. A pilot's duty in war is to get to his target, hit it, and then come back. On the other hand, if what you're doing is crucial, it has to be achieved at all costs, then hitting your target takes a far higher priority than getting back. So I think that is one thing. We must know our goal and know what leads us to it and which of the steps we're taking are the most important. Then I found that you need, as one of the early desert fathers put it, to stand guard over your heart. You don't let fear enter you. And once it's inside you, as we all know, once a niggle or something gets inside one, it is very difficult to throw it out. Therefore, somehow, the moment the thought of fear approaches, hold it at bay. As it were, stand sentry guard over your heart and challenge every movement that comes, friend or foe. I know that I attended and gave many briefings before a raid, and you could watch the people in the room. Some of them were thinking of the danger of the opposition, and that was weighing on them. Others weren't thinking of that at all, they were thinking of what's got to be achieved. Now, the former probably never did the spectacular things, but in my view, there was a braver because I don't see that there can be real courage unless there is also fear. Unless you overcome fear, where is the courage? So we judge people externally by what they've achieved. We don't actually see what's going on in the heart. Only the person himself and God will see that. So we have to be careful in our judgment and recognize, as I think you all do, and as you so certainly clear in your opening remarks, one thinks of the ordinary person, unseen, never did anything spectacular, but he went through to the end and he gave, or she gave, their life. Those are the people I respect and think of most of all. They never got public credit, but they kept going. But I'd like to say, as I began, that it's a great privilege to be your guest today and to have been invited to say these few words. It's a ceremony I shall long remember, so I can never forget my contacts with the 8th Air Force here, 
And then my final of the 509 for the island of Tinian in the final act of the war. May I just end with a little episode that happened to me. When I was in 617, I had a mosquito at a very low level marking for the high precision bombers bombing from the heavy force behind me. And one day, it happens in the Air Force, they took my mosquito away. I was left with nothing except a land, a Lancaster, to do the low level flying. So I rang up the nearest American air base, spoke to the base commander, said, would you give me a Mustang? He said, sure. And the following day, it turned up in a crate. <laughs> and I don't think the Air Force would have done it in reverse to you. But belatedly, perhaps I can express my gratitude, my deep gratitude, for all that you did for our country, our war over here, and for what the kindness that I was shown personally during the war. And thank you, sir, everybody for inviting me. Thank you.